Um, thank you all so much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. So Kai Rizdahl, as you probably know, is the host and senior editor of Marketplace. He's been doing that since 2005. Before then, he was with the Marketplace Morning Report. Before that, he got his start in radio at KQED in San Francisco. He's got some San Franciscans in the house. And he also has had a varied career. He spent eight years in the Navy, uh, flying planes from the USS Theodore Roosevelt. And he was in the US Foreign Service, serving in Canada and China. Other little facts about Kai, he's an avid runner, he's a beer enthusiast, and he's just a really great guy. I'm really excited to have him here tonight. So are we ready for our guest? Give me a little round of applause. <laughs> Whistles, even. Impressive. I'm going to go ahead and do it the way that we kind of would at Marketplace. Live from Le Petit Theater in New Orleans French Quarter, ladies and gentlemen, this is Kai Rizdahl. <laughs> Does that sound mean anything to you? Little known fact, I, I have, um, I call them dead air dreams. When I hear that music and it's not, I'm not where I'm supposed to be, you know? <laughs> it's a little bit like when you were in elementary school and you had those dreams about waking up in your underwear in the middle of the class or something. <laughs> yeah, so I hear that, that music in my nightmares. And you think, am I supposed to be in the studio? Did that's I right. miss my that, cue? That's exactly it, right. it's terrible. <laughs> Hi, by the way. Hi. Thank you all for coming out. It's been a long time. Yeah. It's been a couple of years. I'm gonna go ahead and take this guy off there. Yeah, that's a little better. That is better. Oh, you yeah. think? All right, yeah. good. Um, so you haven't been to New Orleans in quite a while. Since I was 17, <laughs> I came down to visit Tulane. I know, right? I know. But I didn't get into Tulane. <laughs> they are kicking themselves now. I know, that's right. <laughs> But thank you so much for coming. It's a short visit. Absolutely Hopefully you'll be back for a longer time yeah. later on. Uh, we're going to have a wide-ranging conversation okay. about radio, about business and economics, Whatever all kinds of different things. Some personal questions, if you're yeah. so Whatever. inclined. And uh, I thought we'd just start with talking about what a typical day is for you. Now, when you wake up in Los Angeles, it's already three hours ahead in New York, and you work for a business show. That is correct. So give us a little rundown of your morning routine. So, so we, we are, uh, almost by virtue of where we are, behind the power curve as soon as we wake up. I get up at 3.45 uh, every morning, um, and I'll explain why in a minute, um, uh, which is, you know, uh, things are happening in New York at 6.45 in the morning. So uh, I get up at 3.45. I spend an hour to about an hour and 10 minutes just reading in, trying to figure out what's going on. How do I do that? I, I check out my Twitter feed, I got a bunch of blogs I read, I have an RSS reader. You're just, you're reading and trying to figure out what is buzzy, you know? And um, I'm listening to Morning Edition in one ear, I do the Marketplace Morning Report when that comes on, just so that by the time five o'clock rolls around, I have a pretty good handle of what sort of the, the foundational stories and elements of the day are. Uh, and then at five, um, I go for a run. <laughs> uh, because, uh, and this is where the timing comes in. I have a 15-year-old who has to leave for school at 6.30 in the morning, which he needs to be in the shower at six, which means I need to be out of the shower at six, and if it takes me an hour to run, then I gotta get up at 3.45. Um, I know, right? Uh, so I go for my run, and, and while I'm running, I am sort of cogitating upon all that stuff. I'm not a guy who runs with earbuds in. I'm not a guy who takes the dogs with me. That's kind of like my own brain time, you know? And it's, it's uh, the beautiful part now, actually, is that the sun is up at five o'clock in LA. It's just coming over the mountains. Um, so I don't have to wear my little headlamp. But usually it's dark, and I'm just kind of plodding along. And it's just sort of my time to ruminate on, on what I think is gonna be important that day. Um, so I come back, kids get up, yada, blah, blah, blah. I'm out the door and I'm at Marketplace by 7.15 in the morning, downtown LA. We have our morning editorial meeting at, uh, at 7.30 uh, where we figure out what it is that we need to talk about based on how much time we have in the broadcast. As Eve well knows, there are pieces in the can, whether they are feature stories or interviews that I've done or interviews with reporters, whatever it is. We have, we have a bunch of stuff in the can every day, but there's a certain news hole. There's, maybe it's six minutes, maybe it's 10 minutes, maybe it's 12, that we have to fill same day. 
And that's out of a 28 minute and 45 second show once you take out all the underwriting stuff. Um, that lasts about a half an hour, 45 minutes. Um, the editors go assign their reporters. The reporters are off and running. And then I dig into research for books I'm interviewing on, research for interviews on news topics that same day, what have you. Uh, and then about noon, LA time, uh, I sit down and I start writing the show. And Eve has seen me many times in my little corner office there at Marketplace, just kind of hunched over my keyboard, um, uh, figuring out what I'm going to say on the radio. Because we go on the air at 2 o'clock every afternoon, LA time. Uh, and of course, the penalty for an incomplete at 2 o'clock is death. So it, it, <laughs> That's where those nightmares come in. Uh, yeah. Um, so it gets a little frenzied. And, and it's funny because there are days when I sit down at noon and the show just comes to me. Uh, and then there are days when I sit down at noon and then I sit down again at 1 o'clock. And then I sit down again at 1.15. Um, but I start writing the show from the bottom up. I, I, I do the feature story introductions first and I think about the interviews we've got and where they're going to go. And so I work my way backwards through the show this, so that by, by 10 minutes to 2, uh, I'm writing the top of the newscast and the open to the broadcast. And I, I have yet to figure out why it is that I do it that way. The only thing I can come up with is that um, it warms me up. Doing it backwards warms me up. And then hopefully by the time 10 minutes to 2 rolls around, I'm doing my best stuff. Because you want the best stuff right up at the top, right, so that everybody's listening to you. Um, so I finish about five minutes to two, because nothing concentrates the mind like a deadline. Um, uh, and then I go brush my teeth every day. I was hoping you I, were going to put that in there. I, I like to be minty fresh. <laughs> That's the God's honest truth. And every, you know, I mean, how many times have you seen me walking down the hallway at two minutes to two? We all know exactly where you're going. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really funny. People will see me and they're like, oh, showtime? And I'm like, yeah. Yep, obviously and, it's your time. Uh, and then, and there you go. And at two o'clock, the gong sounds, and we're off and running. And whatever happens, happens. Right, right. And there's a director behind the glass. Oh yeah. They do the whole pointing. Yep. He goes, "Go Kai, go Kai." Yeah. Pointing, going. The music starts. I, I don't actually talk until somebody points at me. It's um, yes. it's it's me on one side of the glass in the studio, and then in the control room, obviously, there's an engineer, there's a director who's in charge of keeping up up us on time because. You know, the show is 28 minutes and 45 seconds long. It's not 28 minutes and 46 seconds long, and it's not 28 minutes and 44 seconds long. Um, it's, it's as long as it is, and somebody's got to get us in and out. You've got to say, this is 8 p.m. at the end. I have to. That list, last little three-second exactly blurb. Exactly, right where it's supposed to go. Yeah, standing day. up, by the way. You host the show standing I up. Do. I do. And, and so, so here's what happened. So when I, started at Mar when I started in radio and when I started at Marketplace, I sat down, and, and I, was a, I was a sitter. And so, you know, you'd, you'd be in the studio at a desk, uh, and the microphone would be on a stand. Um, and we were having some, some coaching one day, early on in my time at Marketplace. I had been there probably two years. Um, and we were doing some writing exercises and some, some voicing exercises. Uh, and the guy who was doing the training said, OK, Kyle, your turn. So I took my copy, and I sat up straight, and I squared my shoulders, and I straightened my papers, and I sat in my chair like this. And I did my thing, and it was fine. Right? Uh, and then he said, okay, now stand up. And, and I did. And it was transformational. Um, and you can, you can go back and you can find, I'm sure we could, find the tape of the last day I did sitting and then the first day I did standing. And it was like night and day. I use, as you can see, I use my whole body uh, when I'm on the radio. Those, the, I have two rules. One is just be yourself, but the other one is don't think about how you sound on the radio while you sound on the radio while you're on the radio, or you will screw up how you sound on the radio. <laughs> um, so I, I try not to think, but also I I mean it's I'm I'm in a way I'm playing a part, right? Um, and that's um, that's how I do what I do, I guess is the answer. I want to give a little bit more insight on yeah. the editorial meetings because while I was a reporter at Marketplace for the last two some three years, I was there. I started on the whiteboard mm -hmm. that we're talking about. This editorial meeting that happens involves everyone sitting around a table, then one poor soul who has to stand at the dry erase board and write down every idea that everyone gives out to be possibly included in the show for yeah. the day. And we're just throwing ideas at them, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, you know. And you're not a business guy. You don't have a business no. background necessarily. I certainly wasn't. So sitting there with all these people coming at you with these ideas that they've been thinking about, maybe not since 3.45 in the morning, all no, of them, by the way, regimented, that's where that Navy experience <laughs> comes in handy. Um, 
And you're going around the table, people bring three, four, or five ideas, they discuss them, they're going around figuring out what that eight or 10 minutes of the show that's open for the yeah. day should include, and then even deciding if some other things need to go is something so important that, yeah. hey, let's, let's blow up the show, as we would say, and just devote more time to something else. So what, when you're hearing around the table all those ideas, we used to use this term, marketplace -y. Yeah. And it's this ineffable thing that there were long meetings about trying to define, but to you, what, what would make an idea marketplace -y? What makes you say, yeah, that needs to be in today? Well, so let's back up and, and talk about why we have to be that way, right? <laughs> um, first of all, what we do, and I apologize to those of you who are in business in the audience, but what we do is fundamentally boring stuff. If I lean into the microphone and say, Leading economic indicators, we're up 3.2% today. That's a six tenths percent chance for my, right? My mom is gonna turn off the radio, right? And I will, t I will tell you that I am the only 50 year old man in America whose mother knows exactly where he is every single day, okay? So when I tell you my mother would turn off the radio, that is actually A, true, but B, it's a sign of how seriously we take not doing leading economic indicators, we're up 4.2%, right? Because that's, that's horrible stuff. So, that's item one. Item two is that um, we have to, um, and we pride ourselves on not being all things considered. We are in many markets, I confess I don't know what it is here, but we are in many markets surrounded by all things considered. And our value add, the thing we bring to the table that makes people want to pay attention to us and fundamentally makes Eve want to put Marketplace on her radio station, and I get that it's not her radio station, um, <laughs> Is that, is that- Your the, radio is station. Is that there, that's right, that's right. There you go. <laughs> so the thing that our value add is that essence of making it listenable, informable, informative, and accessible all at the same time. That's the name of the game. So how do we do that? Okay, so part of it clearly is me, right? Part of it is my ability to make you stick around for all 28 minutes and 45 seconds of the broadcast. That fundamentally is my job, right? Make sure that everybody who's listening at the beginning is still there at the end. If you take, however, all of the me in the broadcast, forget the interviews, right? But if you, if you just take those 30 second snippets of me setting up reporter pieces, it's like four minutes of radio, it's nothing. And it's me just talking, and who needs that? So what we try to do is make those reporters understand that they can do virtually anything they want without being infantile or disrespectful, right? They have to grab the audience, shake them and say, listen, this is important, and here's a really good device that we have. So marketplaceiness is that ineffable, ineffable, sorry, um, thing that makes you want to pay attention. Sometimes it's humor, sometimes it's the gravity of a topic, um, sometimes it's literally something as simple as uh, me in an interview going, oh, come on, really? Because you will never ever hear Steve Inskeep or Robert Siegel or Renee Montaigne or Audie Cornish say, oh come on, really? <laughs> so that's kind of it in a nutshell, right? We, we have to make you want to pay attention. Right, you might start, so the assigning process after the meeting, yeah. then you've got a few hours of your reporter to find your sources, to write the thing, to get the thing done, to run to the studio, to run past Kai's office a few times. Um, it was always very flattering if Kai didn't change your intro <laughs> because it meant you'd written something good, you know? Sometimes you'd hear the intro on the air and it totally changed. You're like, God, that is so much well, better. But, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's interesting because it's, I, I have a really hard voice, not a voice voice, but a really hard um, internal voice to write for, right? And not everybody at Marketplace can do it. Even the producers who work most closely with me often can't get it and it's, it's, um, it's a challenge, I think, for reporters to do that. And sometimes they win and sometimes they don't, but, but you know. It's, it's the oh, come on, really thing. Right. Where you've got to right. sort of cut to the chase. Right. And I think that there's, um, there's something interesting about how you found your voice as a host in that way. Where did you get that sense of authority? Oh, I'm allowed to just say this. I'm allowed to just say, markets are really awful today. Without needing to you know, know it up and down and back and forth, and by which I mean to say, how did you get into journalism, Kai? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, although the first part of that question is, is really- We can take it in two parts. Is, is more interesting. Um, but the answer will be, I don't know. Um, all right, how did I get into journalism? How much time do we have? 
because um, it's a long story. Uh, I'll give you the the the, semi the marketplace longer. newscast ninety second spot 90 version. Spot all. Okay, um, I spent uh, as uh, uh, Paul, I think, said eight years in the United States Navy. I spent four years in the Foreign Service working at embassies in Ottawa, Canada. Lovely place, not very foreign. Um, and, be and Beijing, China. Um, while very foreign. We're, while, we're in, but yeah, while we were in Beijing, my wife and I, um, we were both working at the embassy. Um, I had been in government for 12 years, uh, and it was time for me to do something else. She uh, wanted to go to graduate school. So we said, OK, fine, we'll leave the Foreign Service. We will, she will apply to business schools. Uh, and we'll see where we land. We landed in Menlo Park, California, where Steph got into the Graduate School of Business at Stanford. Um, so she started, um, this was the spring of 97, summer of 97. She started um, math refresher courses to get ready, ready for her MBA coursework. And I, at the age of 34, freshly married, without a job, uh, and thinking about having a baby, um, tried to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up. And if you've ever been 34, freshly married, without a job, about to have a baby, and trying to figure out where, what you want to be when you grow up, it's, it's a dark, dark place. <laughs> I was, and I, and I was, honestly, I was, I was moping around. I was absolutely no fun to be around. I had taken a job at the Borders Bookstore in Palo Alto, California, if ever anybody's been out there. I was making $7 an hour. I got a raise to $7.25. Um, and finally, one day in like August, Steph sat me down and said, listen, you need to get your head out of your ass. She, she denies this, by the way. Um, uh, you need to think about what it is you want to do, and I think you ought to try journalism. You're this freak that's up at 5 o'clock on a Saturday morning to read the New York Times. You are engaged with all things current events and stuff that's going on in the news and yada yada, and I, this is what I think you should do. Uh, and I said, okay, sweetie, sure, thanks, and went on about my way. Um, and then, like three days later, I was in the bookstore and I was shelving books at closing time. And when you, when you work at a bookstore, you have to go around and pick up all the books that people have browsed throughout the day and not put back. Uh, and I, I was putting them on the shelves, and I found myself in the career and counseling section. Uh, God's honest truth. And I, I reached for the book, and it was one of those um, guides that lists like every internship in the United States, right? You know, those like college books they have and all this stuff. So this one listed internships. And so I started flipping through it, and I found the name and number of the senior news editor at KQED, which is the public radio station in San Francisco. Uh, and I sat down and I wrote him a letter, an actual letter. This was you know, before email and all that stuff. Um, and I said, in essence, I'm uh, broadly experienced, well-educated, widely traveled. Uh, I'm interested in journalism. Could we talk? Two days later, my phone rings. He says, come on up. Talk to me. So I went up and we had a meeting. And he said, obviously, I can't give you a job. But what if you come an intern for us a couple of days a week? And I said, sure. Uh, and that is how uh, I found my way to, to public broadcasting and to, to public radio. The, the story goes on, and we can talk about it later. But that's, that's, it. that's the, the genesis of it right there. Right, right. And you went from there to Marketplace, and you've, you've been there for? I've been at Marketplace for way too long, yes. <laughs> He's the voice of Marketplace. What do you <laughs> expect? So from there, though, back to this sort of question about finding your voice and, and feeling authority, especially with a topic like business and economics. I yeah. mean. When you, when I sighed, when you were giving your answer about the show's sort of daily grind and making things understandable, it can feel like a huge amount of pressure, especially in recent years, to tell people what's going on in the world of right. money. Right. So how do you balance knowing more and learning more with staying fresh enough that you can still explain it to the rest of us, as right. we say? So, so again, two parts to that answer. The first one is that when I started at Marketplace, I had no business being on the radio. I was a history and political science major all alone in the middle of the night explaining the global economy to two and, what was then two and a half million people. It was, it was just, it was ridiculous. And, and JJ Yor, then the general manager at Marketplace, had no business hiring me, but he was desperate. He was looking for some guy who would get up in the middle of the night and go to work, and that was me. Um, but I, I did what journalists do, and I, you know, so I came out of a year and a half at KQED, and I got this job at Marketplace. Uh, and I did what I had learned to do, which is you call people and you say, explain this to me. Help me make this make sense. Help me understand why this matters. And I would call Stephen Beard in our London bureau. I would call Jocelyn Ford, who was then in Beijing for us. I would call once the sun started coming up, people on Wall Street, and get them to explain to me why things mattered. So that's how it starts, right? You have to ask these questions. 
How I do it now, um, I just know. And I, th I think one of the failings of journalism today is that reporters are reluctant to, for fear of charges of bias, state objective fact as objective fact. Um, and we're not talking about me saying the markets were up today because you know it was a Santa Claus rally. That's not what that is, right? It's saying, um, you know, uh, the Veterans Administration is in trouble because it doesn't have enough resources or whatever, whatever it is, right? But s saying things that you know to be true by virtue of your experience in journalism, right? I mean, you know things about New Orleans now that you that you are the subject matter expert on, right? You are. I'm getting there. You're getting there, right? <laughs> yeah. Sure. You know, yeah, but, but you can just say but, things and, you and know I after now, a certain after point. After 12 years at Marketplace, I can tell you definitively that X happened because X. Mm -hmm. And and um, I am protected in doing that by the support structure at Marketplace, by the ethos we have of what it is that we do, which is explaining to people why things are happening, um, and because it's good journalism, fundamentally. I mean, being a business journalist is a specific place because you, you enter this world that has its own language, that has its own um, even definitions, you, you yeah. know, the, and the definitions are then political over time and that, that type of thing. I, I think that there is a challenge in learning more about it because you, you are now. You have basically at least a, an MBA, if not a PhD in economics at this point with all the work that you've done. So you are learning more and you are in it and your own curiosity might lead you to ask that insider-y question that builds on the last time you talked to this Yale professor. Right. But instead, you've got to be there to serve the audience and like snap back to, OK, what's the last time this person in the audience checked in on corn prices? Right. They don't necessarily remember that right. 2011 story I did about the drought and the barges and the thing and the, <laughs> so. Yeah. No, well, it's, it's, and you will hear me do this on the broadcast. It's this little host thing where my job is to be your surrogate, and there is, I don't know if you guys can hear this, but it, it, it makes me crazy when I hear other um, hosts of programs ask questions that clearly they know the answer to, but need to get the person they're interviewing to give the answer to as a way to refresh the audience's mind. There is a way to do it that's elegant and fluid and informative, and then there's a way to do it that's clunky. But, but that's my, my job is to be your representative and to ask the questions that sometimes you guys are thinking of, or to make sure you guys understand. And that goes from everything from, oh, come on, to remind us who that is. You know, there's, there's a huge part of that that I do. Right. I was uh, thinking back today to the very first interview that I booked on Marketplace, that it was, it was my idea, and then it got on, and I was so excited. What was it? It was about gas prices, and it was about gas prices affecting Walmart, because I grew up in a town without a Walmart, <laughs> and the nearest yeah. Walmart was 30 miles away, and when gas prices got really high, sure. it meant people were shopping more in the local stores. There, it wasn't worth it automatically to drive to Walmart anymore. And uh, so I called the general manager of Rosier's Grocery and said, I, I ran track with your niece, Christy Lottis. <laughs> Can we interview you for that. Marketplace? And so you did the interview with this general manager of, of the grocery store, but then, you know, half an hour later, you interviewed uh, the head of the SEC or something right. like that. So when you're approaching interviews, how do you approach an interview with a quote unquote regular person who is actually an expert in what, what they know about right. versus approaching an interview with a CEO who then you have to get to be a real person? Right. Um, we have in our Rolodex uh, a rancher from Rolla, Missouri named Ken Lennox. He's 75 years old, he's a former Marine, he's been on the farm his whole life uh, and I could just listen to him talk all day um, because he's got one of these, you know, yes sir, no sir, all that stuff. Um, and I love talking to him because you can just have a conversation. And it's, this isn't to say that I go into it without a structure. My producers and I go over what it is that we want to get out of the interview. But within that framework, it's me having a conversation with Ken Lennox. And it's everything from, um, uh, you know, how much grass he's got to feed his bulls, to, or to feed his cattle, to uh, why he's selling off a bull because he had a problem, and this is a quote, with his working parts. <laughs> um, 
Well, actually, actually, what he said was, and I had a bull that got into trouble. And I said, wait, how do you get a bull that gets into trouble? And he said, I had a problem with his working parts. Um, so, so, you know, so as long as I hit those things that we, as a production staff, have agreed that we want to get out of the interview, then I think we're good to go. When it's, when it's a much higher profile interview, um, whether it's you know, a congressman or uh, uh, the head of the SEC or President Obama, there is obviously much more um, formal arranging of how I'm going to talk about things. And, and this actually is a good moment to talk about this fact. Um, I'm not alone out there. I know that I'm the guy who gets to talk into the microphone, but there is behind me and behind everybody on Marketplace, whether it's David Roncaccio or, or Lizzie O'Leary on the weekends or uh, Ben Johnson on our tech report, there is a staff of producers and editors who are feeding us information, who are giving us ideas, who are making sure that we ask the right questions, who are sometimes in the control room whispering in our ears saying, all right, he didn't answer that question. You gotta hit him on that one again. Um, it's, it's very much a team effort, and I just have the great good fortune to be the guy on the pointy end of the microphone. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, you're putting the show out to 11 million right. listeners a week for all the three programs, right. and the staff there does a lot, including, I know a lot of people wonder, the music. Oh yeah. That's the director's choice. Yep. And I would like some of you to know that there is a little bit of New Orleans music right. in the music library. Courtesy of. Some of that is courtesy to me. <laughs> so if you think you hear the Dirty Dozen Brass Band, you're probably right. There is some meters yeah. in there. And, and that's a really fun aspect of the show. It keeps it moving, keeps it going. We, we, we get, I would say, more comments on, in the aggregate, more comments on our music than any stories. <laughs> Seriously. And the, and the number of people in my Twitter feed who think I choose the music is really high, which is just laughable, because I'm not a music guy. <laughs> so I also wanted to ask about the recent years in the economy and your yeah. sort of front row seat to the yeah. collapse and what seems to be a recovery. Um, how did that change your own thinking about your job? And I guess nothing less than thinking about America. Yeah. Uh, we have on our morning show, and he was there when I was the host, and he's now there with David Brancaccio still, a guy by the name of Alan Sloan, who has quite possibly the most annoying radio voice ever, but he has been on, but he has been on Wall Street forever. Uh, and so he, he understands uh, what happens in business and the economy. And he said to me at some point in like 2009, 2010-ish, you know, this, this financial crisis is a horrible thing for the economy, but for you and me, it's great. <laughs> Which is a terrible thing to say, but it's completely true, and here's why. It is, completely clear now to the overwhelming majority of Americans in a way that it never had been before, dating back to the Great Depression, that what happens on Wall Street and in the economy matters fundamentally. And that if we don't, as a society, understand what is going on, then we will lose. That's not to say that we would have all understood auction rate securities and been able to stop it right, or toxic assets, or any of that stuff. But so long as we know what's going on, we can take the measures to protect ourselves. Now, as, so, so that's item number one, right? That's, that's the, the formative experience of this thing, is that we are all now so much more aware of what is going on and why it matters, which is, which is a, 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 a great thing for, for those of us in business journalism, but I think also a good thing for the country. Um, as to the recovery. There is a recovery. I mean, you saw this morning's news of, of gross domestic product shrinking in the, in the most prior quarter, right? Down 1%, which is bad news, right? That's, that's really not good news. Now, there's a whole bunch of technical reasons about inventory management and all that stuff as to why that happened. But the idea that we are perhaps for the, what, fourth spring out of five or the fifth spring out of six, no, fourth spring out of five, taking uh, you know, one step forward and two steps back is a scary proposition. Right? Um, so that's kind of problematical. But when you look at other things, right? When you look at consumer confidence, when you look at consumer spending, when you look at the housing market, which while a little bit flat lately has rebounded quite nicely, um, do not look at the stock market. The stock market doesn't count. Don't look at the stock market as not the economy. Um, things are generally positive. And I think now, by and large, we the public have learned the lessons of the financial crisis now. There are people who have not necessarily learned the lessons of the financial crisis, and they are the Congress of the United States <laughs> and the financial industry, right? 
And, and you, have, you have to look no farther than Jamie Dimon and the London Whale uh, at J.P. Morgan. Uh, you have to look no farther than um, Dodd-Frank and, and the um, tortuous process that it was, has been, and is in getting financial reform legislation passed in this country and, and implemented. I mean, there's still a lot uh, uh, of things that have to be done to get us back to where we were. But, I mean, we've added back almost all the jobs that we lost. Yes, there are still many, many unemployed people in this country. Um, but the economy is growing and there is recovery in, in, in the aggregate, right? If you go around and, and talk to people in you know, smaller towns and cities, they will tell you that there are still hard times. And those feelings are real and they're valid and they're important. But it's important to keep the larger picture in mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's so important to think about whose eyes you're going to look through when you're putting the show together. Who's, whose view are we going to see this from today? And you want to be, over time, getting behind everybody's eyes, if possible, trying yeah. to see it from all the different points of view. And the psychology behind economics and business is something that Marketplace has been especially interested in and I think great at exploring in recent years. And that's kind of a new field. How have you felt about all the coverage of how people think and feel in relationship to what's going on in business and economics? It, it is all about how you think and feel. I mean, truly, if you're not willing to pull out your wallet and spend 10 bucks on whatever it is, then we as an economy are doomed. So no pressure, <laughs> right? All economics um, is behavioral well, economics. All, all right, but um, but I mean this stuff matters, and, and I I try not to repeat myself on the broadcast, but I think probably twice, maybe three times in the past nine years that I've been uh, on the marketplace, I've started the show with a version of, hey, psst, hey you, it's all your fault, and it's been on days when consumer confidence has been down, consumer spending has been down. I mean it the the idea that how we feel matters is actually true. I mean, it does matter. And it is all about how we, the American consumer, view things. Because that goes to buying houses, it goes to buying cars, it goes to whether kids make the decision to go to college or not. I mean, it permeates everything. So one question before we get to a little uh, fun radio exercise. Yes. How do you see New Orleans? We're a city we love to know what people think of us. Yeah. And while you're not spending a lot of time here, you have over the years been hearing some stories from yeah. me and others. Uh, we get compared in some circles to Detroit. We get compared to Las Vegas. Hey, not, not direct comparisons. Not I'm it's saying this is an economics. I'm not making these up. Um, but so where do you think, I guess, New Orleans and maybe just the region of the South fits into this, this big story yeah. that you're telling every day on Marketplace? I, you know, so the interesting thing to me, uh, coming back here for the first time in a long time, and obviously for the first time since Katrina, is the idea that New Orleans is back. I mean, New Orleans is back in a big, big way, and it's really remarkable. The energy and the dynamism um, that you can see and feel just out on the streets walking around for two hours this afternoon, let alone talking to uh, people upstairs, uh, is remarkable. The idea that there are so many entrepreneurs coming here, that Hollywood is coming here, that you have this amazing natural asset in the river uh, and the port system is remarkable. We talked to a guy in, God, where is he? Oh, he's in Mississippi, sorry. He's in Vicksburg, Mississippi. But he's a barge captain, right? And he runs a barge company. And he talks about that river. Um, first of all, it's his livelihood. Um, it's in his blood. Um, and for him, it's a living thing. But the, the thing I get when I come away from a conversation with him is the, the vitality that exists in the American economy because of that river. He ships oil and crude products, right? But it could be anything on those barges going up and down the Mississippi. Um, this region now fundamentally is back and it matters and it's a really cool thing to see. And I think in the next you know, 18 months as those 10 year anniversary stories come up and you guys get to put it, I think, behind you, um, it will really mark a transformational moment, I think, in the, in the uh, development of New Orleans and of the South too. Well, with that compliment on your lips, I'm gonna yes. have you do a little exercise All for right. us. Um, we're going to have you do something you do every day, although this will be a New Orleans version of it. And after this, we're going to open it up to audience Q&A, and I'm mm -hmm. going to leave you right. on stage with that. going to give you center stage for this little exercise. I, I have to stand up, because I can only do this standing up. <laughs> exactly. I was hoping you would do that. Yeah. So. And, and actually, you will see, I, I do it like this. I was going to, I can't really demonstrate I'm, in the dress. I'm serious. This, th th isn't this the way I do so it? So Kai was in runner's world, oh as I mentioned, God. he's an avid oh runner. God. 
And they oh did a photo God. shoot. In the studios, right? And they said, we want oh you to put God. on your running shorts and go into the studios. We and were laughing. Oh the whole production God. staff, you guys got to get in here and see this. Kai's in short, short running shorts. like Doing a little stretch in front of the microphone. Yeah, like, stretch in front of the microphone. Leg up in yeah, the short shorts. Let's be sure shorts. to get that picture. Yeah. Let's be sure well, to get I'm that gonna picture I'm going to get out of your right way. There. I'm going to get out of your way so you can get that one. Jesus. <laughs> Man. So we've got, we've got the music queued up. I think you know what this means. Kai, we're gonna do a little bit of it. Uh, whenever you are ready. All right, here we go. But now, let's do the numbers. <laughs> New Orleans, of course, swings. It is where jazz was born, and it has three times more businesses with jazz in the name than any other city. Jazz dry cleaners, jazz daiquiris, anybody? <laughs> New Orleans turns 300 years old in 2018, one of the oldest cities in the United States. Makes sense then that it has the most buildings on the National Register of Historic Places, 35,000. Washington, D.C. is a very distant second, by the by. As for seconds, Louisiana is second in the nation in oil and gas and seafood production, first in salt, though. Who knew that? On a not so great note, New Orleans has the highest incarceration rate in the country, also a high poverty rate, almost 29%. Overall, unemployment in the Crescent City, though, lower than the national average, with more jobs on the way, not surprisingly, at the port of New Orleans, as I was just talking about. This stretch of the Mississippi River is the busiest waterway in the world, 6,000 vessels passing through it each year, and you are busy having fun here as well. New Orleans, 117 live entertainment venues hosted 29,000 gigs in 2013, and the number of public radio news stations in New Orleans, that would be one. Your <laughs> Your radio station, WWN. <laughs> all, all credit to Ms. Crow. All credit. As, as we turn up the lights uh, so that I can see you guys, Alex, can we turn those up and, yeah, get the, yeah. Um, we're gonna have a couple of mic runners. I don't know where they are. There's Janet and there's one of them and there is a woman I don't know on the other one. Um, do me a favor and raise your hands and the mic runners will find you. If you're in the balcony, high balcony, um, just yell and I'll repeat them if I have to. Like four people waved, what is that? Could you be more lame? Man. Um, before we start the Q&A, and we'll go, uh, we'll go plus or minus 20 minutes here. Um, a word about uh, public radio stations and what they mean in our society. And I will be very brief here. Um, I have the best job in public broadcasting because I get to do whatever I want to do on the radio pretty much every single day. The only reason I get to do that is because of the people in this room. The people who care enough, the people who spend the time, the money, the energy to be involved, to contribute and make a difference in what happens at WWNO and then again at the higher levels in NPR and ETC and Morning Edition. So I do thank you for all it is that you do because without it, I don't have a job. <laughs> all right, where are we gonna start? We're gonna start right there, yes sir. Kai, thank you for coming to New Orleans. Just curious, you mentioned it with Dodd-Frank, but any change that Congress proposes and passes is inevitably called a reform. Yeah. Uh, it seems that the media give, defers to Congress and assumes that everything is always a reform, which is good. Do you feel that you have an obligation to analyze the laws and describe them more accurately rather than just describe them as reforms? That is a really, really good question, and I'm glad you called me on it, because honestly, I should not be saying that, right? That phrase has been co-opted by politicians to have a, a positive, better spin on it. Healthcare reform, anybody? I mean, that's a, that is a subject that is very much up for debate in this country. I completely agree, uh, and I believe that we should and we try, we don't always meet the bar, but we do try to look at motive and goods, bads, uh, and others when reform uh, is in the air, whether it's healthcare, financial reform, there will soon be VA, administra Veterans Administration reform, uh, it's all coming, but, but that's a really good point. I appreciate the question. Yes. Hi, this is not a really good question. Um, <laughs> but, <Okay. laughs> 
So about a year ago, you ended the show by saying it was your last day on the job. Oh, man. And you were I doing, yeah. Oh, man. I cannot believe that I'm going to And ask you this were going to go work in, like, Florida oh with God. the beer cart or something. Yes. And so then I heard you reference it, like, just, I think, this week or last it was week. La it was last about Friday. About how you got in trouble about it. And so I was just wondering if when you said that, like, did you know that people like me were going to Google, is Kai Ristall quitting? <laughs> So yes, I'm from Reston. I'm not from New Orleans. I man. love New Orleans. I went to Loyola, but oh we live God. in North that Louisiana, and so I came down here just to ask you, was that like a prank? That is, that is <laughs> No. <laughs> okay. So. Oh, my God. I cannot actually believe that was asked. So, here, so here's what happened. So, so it's Friday afternoon, and I'm looking for a final to close out the Friday broadcast, and I see this thing about this company in Florida, it's a health services supply company, where the boss on a Friday afternoon will come around and on the company's dime have a beer cart, and he pushes the beer cart around and gives company people beer. And I'm like, man, I need that job. So I say, I'm gonna make this my final. And better yet, I'm gonna make it sound like I'm quitting to go work at this company. So I said, this final note today, which will unfortunately be my last day on this broadcast because I found a better job, yada, blah, 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 blah. The, th the thing I didn't do was say, I'm kidding. <laughs> so, so I say this on the air on Friday at, at two in the afternoon. I stick around after the broadcast, doing some stuff, yada, yada, blah, blah, blah. 4.30, 5 o'clock rolls around. By this time, the show's gone out on the East Coast, right? Right? My Deb calls, my boss calls me, the executive producer, vice president of American Public Media calls me and she says, what the hell did you do? <laughs> Stations were calling her, listeners were calling her, her boss was calling her. I, I got in so much trouble. <laughs> so, this two weeks ago, I started our Friday wrap by introducing Felix Salmon, who used to blog at Reuters and is now, has gotten a new job at Fusion, right? Felix is a good guy. And also Catherine Rampell, who used to be at the New York Times and is now at the Wall Street Journal, uh, at the Washington Post. And I said, man, everybody's getting a new job except me. And then Felix went off and said, oh, I think you should tell us about that time when you quit on the radio. And, I was like, <laughs> and, and you have to understand that that part of the Friday broadcast is live, right? It's not pre-taped, it's live on the air. And I'm like, you can't, what is that? <laughs> and so I said, don't ask me about that because I got in a lot of trouble. And I, I, I really did. And it is, it is, it is uh, among the higher ups uh, at Marketplace, which above me there's one person, but my boss. Um, and, and in St. Paul, at American Public Media, it is absolutely not a laughing matter. <laughs> we, we, we do not joke. I'll go yeah. right here and then I'll go to the balcony. Yes, sir. And I, I also drove in from Ruston to ask you this question. I was That's wondering, right. yeah, amazing that we're sitting together. Um, I was, <laughs> we're, we're related. Jeez, what, do you, what do you want to know? Well, actually, I was wondering, did you do the show today? Because we were driving in and we couldn't I, catch it. And, and how did you work that out? I like did today? not. David Gura, who's a very talented reporter in our Washington bureau, got the call today because um, he's really good. And, uh, and, uh, and I couldn't do it because I was sitting on an airplane. Yes, in the corner right there in the balcony. Hi, thank you so much for doing this. Sure. Uh, I listen to your show all the time. It's really great. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about the Trump administration. Thank you. Um, you talked about the Biden administration getting closer and how it was intimidating. Um, yeah. Do you feel like by the time it gets down here, uh, it's not going to look the way that it has in the past? Um, so do you think that it is embarking on a massive post-election right. plan? Yeah. Anybody see the op-ed in the New York Times uh, either today or the other day by General Honoré, right? Yeah. Is that how you pronounce his name? Yeah. Um, they're very interesting and a, and a really worthwhile discussion to have. Listen, here's the deal. Uh, and you guys know this better than I do, right? In like 100 years, y'all are going to be underwater, <laughs> right? Um, but one of the ways that we're going to mitigate that, and, and honestly, the name of the game now in climate change is mitigation, 
it's adaptation and mitigation um, of the damage and the harm that's going to come. One of the ways that that's going to be taken care of in a lot of coastal places like New Orleans, and there are parts of Florida, and you know, New York City is going to be underwater as well, and they don't have the estuaries and, and all that stuff that you guys have, um, is coastal environmental management. I th it's, it's critical. I mean, there are, this is a terrible thing to say, there are business and economic opportunities in climate change, right? Everything from what's under the ice cap in the North Pole to some really smart people figuring out how to do that uh, climate restoration, the uh, wetlands restoration. So I think it's, it's critical because that's what we're going to have to be able to do. Um, and you guys could lead the way, totally. I, you know, I don't know how much y'all are going to spend on it, but hopefully it's a lot of money because it's really important. Fifth, well, there you go. All right. <laughs> Who's got the microphone down here? Anybody? Yes, hi. Hi. Um, I, I am a financial advisor, so I work in the industry, and I, I wonder if I could get your thoughts. Um, I'm always combating what I call crazy financial media headlines. Jim um, Cramer should be taken off the television. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, can we also come to an agreement that, one, um, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is only 30 stocks and shouldn't yep. be the quoted uh, indices, and um, that if it's marginally up or down, meaning less than a percent, can we just say it's unchanged rather than saying the Dow Jones Industrial Average was up two points today? Um, no. <laughs> um, I, I have a theory, by the way, about the numbers uh, that we do on Marketplace, and the theory goes like this, and I'm, I'm not blowing you off. I'll get to your point in a minute. Um, I believe that people hear like the first two bars of whatever the music is, and then they tune out, and they go, oh, it's up, okay or, oh, it's down. And they, they don't care what I'm saying about company X or you know, bond rate uh, Y. Um, and it's true. I'll, I'll tell you though why the numbers are in the show. Uh, first of all, because people expect them to be in the show, but also because they're our accordion. If we're tight or loose and we need fill time or uh, uh, contract time, then <laughs> It's true. The numbers can be a minute or they can be 40 seconds. And there's 20 seconds, just like that. And it makes the director very, very happy. And it lets us get out on time. Um, so that's why they're there. Listen, you have heard me say, if you're loyal listener to the program, you have heard me say the Dow Jones Industrial Average is not the economy and the economy is not the Dow. It is, however, uh, an indicator that a lot of people use um, as a judge of the health of not the economy, but some of the big companies in the economy. And that's why we do it. You can like it or not, but it, it is, uh, um, a widely um, used measure. Now, should we use the Wilshire or the Russell? Sure. You know, maybe we should, and maybe we'll talk about that. And we talk every now and then about, about changing the numbers, uh, and then we never do, because um, I don't know why. I don't know why. We'll talk about it. Hi, yes, in the middle of the balcony. Yes, you have a great comedic rapport with Stephen Dunn. Yes. Sure, so I should probably start out by saying you haven't heard Dubner on the radio a lot because uh, about a year ago, our partnership with Freakonomics expired, uh, which is really too bad um, because Dubner and I, I think you're right, had a really special relationship on the radio. The really interesting part of that relationship, which we had on air for two years, um, was a result of ha us having met in person one time for two hours. That was it. Every time we did that segment, um, he was in New York, and I was in uh, LA and we were on the phone. Um, but we just had it and I don't know what it is. I don't know what it was. Um, and sometimes you have that, right? And, and it, we, were, we were sad when that partnership ended, but it was, you know, I mean, Freakonomics is his business and that's how he makes his livelihood. And he was going off to write another book which has just come out actually with, with Stephen Levitt, his, his co-author. Um, but yeah, you, f you find those moments in radio and they're really good and they're nice and you, and you try to treasure them. Yeah, do we have somebody over here? Yes, no? Anybody who's got the microphone? Yes, sorry. Stand on up, because it's dark. Oh. I can't really see. Okay. It's a little bit um, tight in the oh, seating I'm arrangement sorry. down here. But um, so I'm going to ask a kind of tough question. Um, probably not a great question in the South. But I just moved from Los Angeles, and I went to UC Santa Barbara. And in light of what just happened there, there were six people killed. Uh, over the weekend, I don't know, they didn't talk about it much nationally, but here in this city, 19 people were shot over the weekend. And I just want to know, what are some of the numbers that you know surrounding the gun industry and its influence in terms of legislation, and how do we fix this problem? Thank you. 
after um, the shootings in Newtown, Connecticut, I, uh, which was not day of, right? Which was not day of a marketplace story. There's, there's no business and economic angle that we're gonna bring to the shooting of 20 something children in a school. So we didn't touch it in the broadcast, but I felt we had to address it somehow. And so I wrote a final note uh, that started with uh, something about my kids. And uh, uh, basically a confession that probably the reason I was thinking about this was because I have four children. Uh, and I went on to talk about Jay Carney who had said at the president's press briefing that day, this is not the time to talk about this when emotions are running high. And I, st and I ended with, if not now, when? Usually when I write stuff, it pretty much goes straight on the air. My producer looks at it and we put it on the radio. She looked at this and said, all right, wait, hang on. And so we went to our boss, Deborah Clark, the executive producer of Marketplace, and she said, all right, wait a minute. And she went to her boss, the vice president and general manager of Marketplace, J.J. Orr, and he said, whoa, wait a minute. And we went up to the top of the company uh, before I was allowed to say this thing that seemed to me to make so much inherent sense, that if we're not gonna talk about it now, when are we gonna talk about it? Part of that is the institutional paranoia of being accused of bias in public radio land. Um, uh, but part of it was also the idea of me taking a stand on something. And it was a pretty weak stand, right? I mean, all I was saying was, can we talk about this? I say that not as an answer to your question, but as the fundamental underlying reason in my mind why we don't talk about it more, which is that it has become this thing that because of, and I understand that many people in here are life members of the National Rifle Association, but because of the Second Amendment, we can't even have a conversation. And that, <laughs> and that fundamentally to me is the thing, right? Patrick Henry, I disagree with what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say. We, if we can't talk about this stuff, then we can't ever fix it, right? Now, the, the, the thing in Santa Barbara had so many layers to it, right? I mean, there's the, there's the gender thing, there's the mental health thing, and I think it's interesting that the, the gun part of it thing has become lost because of the hor horrific nature of the gender thing. Real, I mean, truly, the societally troubling thing of the gender thing. Um, but, you know, 19 people here in, in, in New Orleans, and, and even I were talking about it on the way over to the event tonight, you know? It's a, it's a systemic and endemic problem. 15. Before that, right? 15 before that. So, so let, me, let me ask you a question, rhetorically of course, but in a marketplace sensibility. How sustainable is that economically when you have 19, what I'm gonna imagine are young men, being killed in a weekend? You can't, you can't. makes no sense. And that's all I'll say, I'll, I'll note it and I'll move on because I don't have the answer. One word. Yeah, One word. where? Oh, oh, I can, oh, what, is this the last one? Wow, this is the last one, all right, let's go to the balcony, where are we? Yes, sir, underneath the open window there, go ahead, you had your hand up for a while. It's okay, I'm traveling, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, there are no writers, I am the writer. Um, every word that comes out of my mouth, I write. Um, and sometimes I amuse myself, you know? <laughs> um, and and, and so I, I like to think it comes off as charming. Sometimes it probably makes me sound like an idiot, but you know, I, here's the deal. If you, if you can't have a good time while you're hosting Marketplace, you're doing it wrong. Um, and with that, I, I thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you all so much.
Thank you so much, Kai. We really appreciate the time and your insights. Thank you so much for the show that you work so hard to write yourself every word, every day. And uh, it was wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you all. We have a final token of appreciation. Kai is a memento. It's, it's kind of a heavenly thing, isn't it? As a memento of your stay here and your visit to New Orleans, we present you with one of our most cherished possessions. <laughs> Relatively speaking, a WWNO baseball cap that you can wear when you're awesome. running. Awesome. Thank you guys very much. Thanks, everybody. Good night. We'll see you.